Hello, this is Glenn Porter, and this is a lecture on infrared photography. Now, before we start this lecture, it's a good idea to make sure that you've listened to the two lectures on the science of light. A lot of the principles in understanding reflected infrared photography really rely on your abilities to be able to understand some of the terminology in light science. So if you haven't watched those lectures yet, it's a good idea to stop here and have a listen to those lectures and then come back to it. By all means, you can move ahead and have a listen to it first, but I really advise you that, uh, suggest to you that you may not understand some of the concepts associated with infrared photography unless you actually have listened and understood those two previous lectures. Okay, so let's let's kick along and let's have a look at what infrared is. So infrared actually means further on than red. As we know, uh, we categorize red as 700 nanometers in the electromagnetic spectrum. The visual spectrum is between 400 and 700, and infrared is beyond or further on than 700 nanometers. This suggests a couple of things. Firstly, that we cannot see infrared because it's outside our human vision, visual spectrum. But also it's not uh, as a, a light because the visual spectrum is what we consider white light or visible light. So because infrared radiation is, or infrared is outside visible light, we can't really call it or describe infrared as infrared light. It's referred to as infrared radiation. There are two categories of infrared. There's near infrared and far infrared. And infrared has a much larger, um, it, it is much larger and more expansive within the electromagnetic spectrum than actual visual light. Visual light's very tiny. So because infrared is outside our visual spectrum, it's mostly referred to as invisible radiation or we just call it IR or just infrared. Now there are other cameras that are available, more, I guess, scientific cameras called thermal uh, cameras and thermal cameras capture into that far infrared or even heat region of energy in the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's not the same as the type of infrared photography that we'll be doing uh, here today and, and, and also practicing it with the JCU uh, infrared cameras. We do have uh, several uh, cameras at JCU, both at Townsville and Cairns, that have been modified for this type of specialised photography. But thermal photography is a different type of photography altogether. So don't don't um, don't mix up the two. Uh, what we're really doing here in uh, this class, and certainly with the cameras that we have, is reflected near infrared photography. If, if you want to be exact with the terminology. So this diagram, we saw this, these diagrams before in this photo before this, the top image is an actual photograph that I took of some light being dispersed through a crystal, a crystal prism. And we can see that uh, we have all our uh, components of the white light separated through this concept of dispersion. Remember dispersion from our second lecture in the lights of science is that separation of wavelengths caused by the different uh, the, the difference between high frequency and low frequency uh, wavelengths going through a more dense medium and that refraction that bends those wavelengths and separating those wavelengths out so what we've got in that first uh, or the top image is actually that result of dispersion the dispersion of white light through that those refract that refraction effect but what you might also notice is that on the left side of the violet area and the right side of the red are these black strips. And what we're talking about in infrared is that area that we see dark here uh, past the red. That, that's that region that we're going to be recording in for reflected near infrared photography. Now the diagram on the bottom shows you this in a more dynamic 
uh, in a, more of a, a diagram effect. So we can see our visual spectrum between that 400 and 700 nanometers and our infrared, it suggests that's up to 14,000 nanometers. It goes from 700 to 14,000 nanometers. So it's a much more expansive component of the electromagnetic spectrum. But our usable range is usually around, in, for photography purposes, around 700 to 900 nanometers. You might be pushing that up to 1,000, 1,100, maybe even 1,200 nanometers, depending upon the, the sensor that you're using. But certainly within that 700 and 900 nanometer range is kind of the, the useful range for near infrared photography. Now the discovery of infrared isn't that old. In 1800, William Herschel first discovered infrared. And Herschel's discovery was uh, a component of a pretty simple experiment really. Image that you see here on the screen, uh, this is William Herschel with some of his best known scientific achievements. And um, we can actually see this experiment that he, he um, conducted to discover, accidentally discover uh, infrared. So ex experiment was quite simple. He had a, a prism um, glass uh, mounted into the wall where direct sunlight would shine through that prism and then disperse the light as prisms do through dispersion. He then got three thermometers and was measuring the different spectrum of that dispersed light. So he'd go through blue and violet, violet and blue and green and yellow and red and so forth and measure the actual temperatures of those spectra. What he discovered accidentally is when he placed the thermometers outside the spectrum past the red, the the temperature actually rose and that was quite uh, interesting to him so he experiments then led to this this development and this discovery that there was actually some energy outside the area that he couldn't see so he couldn't see any light in that region which is infrared because it's not visible to our eyes but he noticed a change in the temperatures and that was the discovery of infrared photography Oh, sorry, infrared in 1800. So very, very simple scientific experiment. Herschel's not kind of well known within the photographic scientific field, except for his discovery of infrared, I guess. Um, although he did uh, suggest, he was the one that suggested the term photography. Uh, not a lot of history is kind of known about this, but to his colleague in Bath, uh, Fox Talbot, he suggested to Fox Talbot uh, with his pencil drawings that he would call that photography, which is drawing with light or light drawing. So it was Herschel that, uh, as the legend goes, was the person that invented the term photography as well. Herschel was better known as uh, in, in astronomy. And we can see in the background there of his portrait, we can see a, a, a model of a telescope and the plans of a, of a, of a larger telescope. Herschel was the royal uh, ast ast uh, astronomer, and uh, he um, he made a lot of discoveries and was quite known for building these telescopes to, to peer into space, which was a very exciting time around the 1800s when you're able to build optical devices that could actually see planets. So Herschel was more known for, for that type of his scientific endeavours rather than the photography components. But in this lecture, I certainly the infrared uh, notion of dis or discovery of infrared is certainly of interest. Okay, so let's have a look at some images uh, that that are shot in this reflected infrared photography. So what you might notice in these images is is some uh, the, 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 they are very different to normal sort of black and white photos. Things that you need to look at is the skies are the blue sky, blue becomes very dark, almost black. And if you look at the grass foliage in the foreground, it's kind of a high, a high value, a high gray value. It's uh, most um, grasses record in a, in a monochrome when you convert them to black and white, they're pretty much about a mid tone, about a mid gray. But you can see in these images, in the infrared images, that they're quite brighter. The trees also, the foliage of the trees are quite bright. 
the leaves are quite bright, but the, um, the trunks and the branches are quite dark. So you get this lovely visual effect with the uh, with trees and foliage uh, with infrared. But it's interesting because not all the trees and 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 uh, re react this way to infrared. So we can see another another infrared shot. We've got the blue lake, so the blue sky, and then we've got the blue lake, or sorry, the lake, uh, the the water. And the water's quite dark. So it's called infrared reflect reflected infrared photography because all our photography really is mostly reflected uh, photography. It's recording the light that's being reflected off the subjects. So in infrared photography, ref re reflected infrared photography, if you want to be exact, it's the same as every other photography, except that we're recording a range that we don't see. And the, the difference, why or well, what makes infrared different is because there are different levels of reflection and absorption happening within the scene of infrared. Because we're only using infrared light, it, it's primarily that, that um, record, it's recording due to that response. So we can see that the foliage in this willow tree is reflecting a lot of infrared. Therefore, it's recording quite bright. Whereas the water is absorbing the infrared, so you get this contrast. So when it's absorbing, it goes dark. When it's reflecting a lot high levels of infrared, it will come bright. So it really depends on the plant species, on the amount of infrared that's reflected. And it also depends on the, the plant health as well. The element that changes this is the, the chemical components in the plant itself. In photosynthesis production, that conversion of um, carbon dioxide to, to air, which is to oxygen, to, which is uh, what plants do and trees do. They absorb, uh, they convert carbon uh, dioxide and, and expel oxygen. And that's what gives us our oxygen in our atmosphere, as, as you're most well aware. But, but it also produces a chemical called chlorophyll in part of this photosynthesis um, process. And the hot that and chlorophyll actually reflects infrared. It has a greater efficiency of reflecting infrared. So plants that have a greater amount of chlorophyll will actually reflect a lot more infrared, and their foliage therefore becomes a lot lighter in tone. So if it's grass, if it's uh, leaves of a tree, but it will all depend upon its its photosynthesis process and the amount of chlorophyll that's 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 within that plant species and within the plant health itself so what we're looking at here is uh, the willow, the willow tree a lot of chlorophyll and a lot of reflection of infrared there's same amount of infrared on the water as there is the plant because it's direct sunlight but there's more reflection out of that foliage because of the chlorophyll and the chemical components of that photosynthesis process happening in the tree the water doesn't have any ability to reflect infrared, it just absorbs it so it goes black. And that's why you get those changes of tonality. If you look at the trunk on that willow tree though, you will notice that there is some areas that are dark, but other areas that are quite mid-tone, which is very much normal normal type of um, photography. Uh, so the, the trunk isn't quite as dark as the first sample I showed you. And if you look to the, to the right-hand side, some of those trees in the background, the foliage isn't that white, certainly not as white as uh, what the willow tree is, is um, actually producing. So the, the amount of infrared, the, the sort of brightness of the foliage really depends on the species of the tree, how much chlorophyll that species produces and the health of the, of the tree itself. So here we see those same things happening here with the conifer trees really reflecting a high amount of infrared because they produce a lot of chlorophyll but if you look at that tree right on the left hand side that's quite dark as compared as uh, uh, compared to the to the tree next to it uh, the grass again is quite uh, bright because it's reflecting a lot of infrared and the sky is dark against the the fluffy white clouds clouds don't have anything uh, they don't have any infrared they don't absorb it they don't reflect it they're just white 
So when we were photographing inanimate objects like this old shot up um, car, we see the, the, the lighter foliage in the, in the uh, field, but the car really hasn't changed in tonality than what it would with a normal black and white photograph. The trees in the background are sort of showing some infrared characteristics, I guess, that lighter foliage and the darker trunks and the sky. You've got that beautiful dark and uh, the dark tone of the blue in the sky against that white wispy clouds. And we can see the same thing happening here. Not much difference in the building. If you photograph this building uh, in standard black and white photography, it would be pretty much the same tonality, but we can see a very dark sky. The blue sky has gone completely black. The tree on the left, the foliage is quite bright, but the trunk is quite dark. So that's, and the grass in the, in the, in the lawn is quite bright as well. Okay, so that's an example of the results you will get from this type of uh, type of photography. So let's look at how we do it and how it works. Okay, now this method works with four optical parameters. The first one is the spectral sensitivity of the capture medium. Whether you use film, it has to be sensitive infrared or a digital sensor the digital sensor has to be infrared. So the spectral sensitivity is one optical parameter. The second one is that the light distribution has to contain infrared. So the distribution of the light source has to contain infrared. If you don't have any infrared in your light source, you can't have any reflected infrared because there's no infrared to start off with. The spectral transmission of the optical filters. So in infrared, in infrared photography, what we're doing now is we're trying to eliminate the visual spectrum and only record in the invisible radiation or infrared region. So we need optical filters to control that. And it's also about the spectral response of the specimen. Now I've explained a little bit in those examples of the concept of reflection absorption, but there are other ways, other responses that we actually get from infrared that I'll talk about later in this lecture as well. So let's put those four rather, I guess, scientific explanations of optical parameters in, into a more common language in photography. So first of all, the camera must record in infrared. That's the spectral sensitivity. Secondly, the light source must contain infrared. That's the spectral distribution of the light source. The filter that we use to um, eliminate visible light must also transmit infrared. That's the spectral transmission of the filter and the subject must either absorb reflect or transmit infrared radiation so those four parameters are that the, the camera must see the infrared the light source must contain the infrared the filter that we use must transmit the infrared and the subject must react somehow to infrared and that's where we get our infrared results okay so let's first of all look at the first parameter the spectral sensitivity now in film we used to have to buy specialized sensitized uh, uh, film that's actually sensitive to infrared. Normal black and white film isn't sensitive to infrared. We can see our panchromatic emulsion has a, a, a sensitivity within the um, ultraviolet range up to around about 680, 670 nanometers doesn't even extend all the way to the end of the visual spectrum. It usually cuts off it slightly to the red, not very sensitive into the red. Now there are, there were, or well, probably still are, um, films that would be considered as extended red sensitivity films, which would extend into slightly into the 740, 750, 760 nanometers. But yeah, your most basic black and white films weren't sensitive to infrared. You would need to get a specialized infrared film, which was films available called HIE or high speed infrared film. Now in the science of light lectures, we looked at the spectral sensitivity of digital cameras when we were explaining this concept of spectral sensitivity. And we found that uh, 
well, what's interesting, I didn't didn't say, what's interesting about digital sensors is that they're highly, they're highly uh, sensitive in infrared and not very sensitive into the ultraviolet. Whereas film, when it's being produced or manufactured, is highly sensitive to, to ultraviolet, but not sensitive to infrared, the complete opposite. So digital cameras are the complete opposite in sensitivity to film. If we look at the spectral sensitivity of a CMOS center, which is the chart I've got on the screen now, we will notice that um, past 700 or in between that 700 and 900 nanometers, that's, that's quite high sensitivity compared to the blue region, which is the 400. So spectral sensitivity of CMOS sensors, that the spectral sensitivity is naturally sensitive to infrared. And if we look at CCD sensors in say Nikon cameras and other type of cameras where the CMOS are in the Canon cameras, we also see this characteristic. So here we have a more extended uh, spectrum, but we see from 400 very low sensitivity. So in the blue region, very low sensitivity. In the 700, we've got a lot higher sensitivity, but in the 800, 900, 1000, 1100 nanometers, we've got a huge amount of sensitivity overwhelming amount of sensitivity in the infrared with CCD, CCD cameras. So the digital sensors are highly sensitive to infrared in a natural form. But guess what? This is a problem for camera manufacturers. It's a big problem from camera manufacturers, particularly when they're designing lenses to perform in the visual spectrum range. And when you buy a camera and you go out and take a photograph, you don't want an infrared photograph. You want a normal, in inverted commas, photograph, a photograph that's that's using the visual light spectrum, not the invisible spectrum that we don't see. So this is a, a problem with digital cameras um, that the manufacturers have to have to get around. And they do that by putting a filter over the sensor. Now, this is a. Um, an infrared blocking filter, or which is also referred uh, often as a hot filter, but it's basically an in infrared absorbing filter. And over the digital sensor, all our digital cameras have an infrared blocking filter installed over them. And this is what this picture sh sort of shows from LifePixel. So what does that mean? Um, that means this. This is the spectral transmission. So now we're talking about spectral transmission of filters at the moment, if you want to refer back to your science of light notes. So this is the spectral transmission of the infrared blocking filter that I took off one of the cameras and measured it through a spectrophotometer. Now what you can see is that the filter, that this filter that was used as an infrared blocking filter on a Canon camera you can see that it's blocked out uh, all the wavelengths from 700 nanometers onwards. And it only really records between that sort of 380 to 680 nanometer window. Are you following that with this, with this uh, transmission curve? So you look at the wavelengths down the down horizontal uh, axes, and we have our percentage transmission on the on the vertical axis on the, the right hand left hand side we can see that it's quite sensitive now if we, if we overlay our spectral sensitivity of our CMOS or CCD sensor um, we're within that 400 and 700 range still fairly low sensitive into the blue range and that's why we get noise in the in, in the blue spectrum but um, what it what it what this is telling us this spectral transmission curve of the infrared blocking filter that all camera manufacturers install over their sensors is that it doesn't allow the cameras to record infrared. So while we while the sensors are naturally sensitive to infrared, the, the infrared blocking filter that they install over the sensor eliminates the possibility of recording in the infrared range, which is great for most of our photography because we don't want that. But when we want to shoot infrared photography, we then have a, this problem of our cameras not being sensitive now to infrared uh, region because not of the, of the sensor, but because of the filter that's installed over the sensor. Now, what we 
uh, want to do, uh, what we want to achieve in infrared photography is a recording of only infrared radiation. We want to eliminate the visual spectrum and we only want to record uh, in that infrared spectrum. So the method that we use in film and in digital is that we place a infrared transmission filter. So this is an infrared transmission filter, a spectral transmission camera, uh, a filter that's actually installed, modified. Uh, so I'll get into modification of the cameras in a moment, but for, for, for this point of view, this is a, a spectral transmission filter that I measured from a filter that was installed onto a camera onto a specially modified infrared recording camera. So what we can see is the transmission of light or radiation that occurs with this filter. So now we don't have any visual spectrum being recorded. We only have around about 820 nanometers onwards that's actually being recorded in that infrared spectrum. So in camera modification, which I'll talk about in a moment, we actually have to take that infrared blocking filter off and then replace it with a tra infrared transmission filter so that infrared light transmits through it uh, to be able to shoot infrared. Now why I'm telling you all this is because I've talked to many people who try infrared and get frustrated with it because they don't know why they're not getting results or they don't they they don't know why they're getting a, a 20 minute exposure wide open with direct sunlight and the reason is that you can't just go out and buy an infrared transmission filter screw it on your everyday digital camera and expect it to work in infrared and, and this is the reason if you look at if we overlay these two filters the infrared transmission filter and the infrared blocking filter we can see the infrared blocking filter in the red is only going to allow those uh, those wavelengths to record on the sensor. And then we screw a infrared uh, transmission filter on the front of our lens. We're only, we're only letting in um, ra radiation or, or wavelengths that are 820 meters above, but, but none of that can actually get past the infrared blocking filter that's located or, or position on the sensor. There are always light leaks. There's always some leak area that uh, that that some recording occurs. So it's ne never gets 100% attenuated. But that's why it's this 20 minute or 40 minute exposures, which I've heard from some people um, with this type of technique where they just go and buy an infrared filter, they go to the camera shop and say, I want to want to do infrared photography buy buy an infrared filter for three four hundred dollars screw it on the front of the lens and expect to get results and this is the reason why you don't get those results because the infrared blocking filter and the transmission filter are not compatible one's letting in one part of the spectrum and the other one's blocking out the other part so you get in effect zero results so that's talking about the spectral sensitivity that was the first optical parameter the second optical parameter was that then the light source must contain infrared now lots of light sources already um, contain infrared direct sunlight which is what we use mostly for uh, reflected infrared photography contains loads of infrared so that's that's a light source that's not problematic some other artificial light sources uh, quartz halogen lamps tungsten incandescent lamps high high pressure mercury vapor lamps certainly do xeon flash tubes uh, do as well you might find that fluorescent tubes have very little infrared the fluorescent tubes in offices and um, and places even the maybe even the sort of home fluorescent lamps now not the incandescent tungsten lamps but they've been replaced by fluorescent lamps i haven't measured them but being fluorescent usually means that they're high in uv and very low in infrared um, the way fluorescent lamps work, it's a collision of electrons, but the phosphor coating uh, fluoresces and produces the light. Now that phosphorus coating can actually uh, is can actually be warm white, cold white, and so forth. 
but I'd be very surprised if it actually emits any infrared uh, because the basis of the light is very much UV. The phosphorus is irradiated or excited by the ultraviolet light that's actually produced in the collision of electrons and then they glow and produce the light source. Uh, so I'd be very surprised if they have high level high levels of infrared. So if you're shooting under those lighting conditions, you have to be aware that if there's no infrared in the light source, you're not going to be able to record infrared photography. But most light sources do contain uh, uh, infrared. Certainly direct sunlight uh, has plenty oodles and oodles of infrared. So I've got a couple of um, spectral distribution curves to show you uh, some of the characteristics of some light sources. This is a tungsten halogen light source. And we did see the same curve in the in the science of light lectures. So we can see very low blue content at 400 nanometers, but very high uh, content in the infrared. But tungsten halogen light sources are very what we call a slow light source. They're not very bright when you compare them to electronic flash or the direct sun. Tungsten halogen is a very low level of illumination compared to those other light sources. But they do contain a lot of infrared and suitable for infrared as well. Electronic flash does contain some, some uh, infrared, uh, not so much um, as the tungsten halogen in comparison, although the, the flash, uh, electronic flash is a lot brighter. So in its essence, it probably, probably contains the same amount. So your exposure levels are pretty much the same. Electronic flash has very little, if or no ultraviolet on the other end of the spectrum uh, because of the ultraviolet coating on the on, on the uh, flash tubes. If you look at electronic flash tube, you'll notice that it's quite, it's a slight yellow color. And that's because uh, it has actually ultraviolet um, coating over it, which was a, a safety mechanism so that the ultraviolet light is being reduced when you use flash photography. Okay, so the third optical parameter was the spectral transmission of the filter. And this is kind of the concept we're trying to do with infrared. So we have our light source, which has uh, contains ultraviolet, visalite and infrared. And what we want to do is only use the infrared only. So we need an infrared transmission filter. So it transmits infrared, but absorbs or reflects all the other radiation and light. So it reflects uh, UV and it reflects or absorbs um, the vis visible light and only transmits infrared so that we only get an infrared image. Now our stock standard infrared filters in the Rattan series you can see here uh, this is from Kodak, uh, Kodak filters and it, the Rattan 87 is the stock standard type uh, where the starting point for infrared infrared filters, but then you've got the 87C, you can see there, 87B, 87A. Now we haven't talked about optical filters and we may produce a lecture on optical filters later, later, uh, later on um, if, it's, if, if it's applicable. But one of the standards, if you like, of, op of optical filters was a system developed by Kodak which is called the Rattan series. Now, when you're buying optical filters, you will always, uh, colored filters, you'll always, um, they, they would mostly refer to the Rattan series number. So Rattan series number is really just a like a catalog of the characteristics of the optical filters. So what you'll notice with the cameras that we've modified at JCU is that I'll explain them as their equivalent to a Rattan 87C. And that's the transmission curve of the Rattan 87C there. You can see that there. They're not actually, we don't actually use Kodak filters. We use other types of filters, but they're equivalent to the Rattan 87C. So it's Rattan series has become a standard in optical filters. Even though I don't think they make, um, Kodak doesn't make filters anymore. It's still the standard in photography. So this is a B&W infrared transmission filter, and it's zero, code 093, but it's also a 87C equivalent, Rattan 87C equivalent. So this is the transmission curve I've measured from my black and white infrared filter. And you'll see that from 800 or 
50% transmission. So with, I didn't mention, I don't think I mentioned this in the light science, but when you're describing the cutoff points of filters, you don't describe when it's where it's first intersects. You actually describe the 50% uh, transmission or 0.5 or 50% transmission is kind of where the characteristic is. So at 50% transmission, we have around about 820 nanometers. This is also what we call a long pass filter, which means that it only passes through longer wavelengths. So it has its 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 uh, its edge, the junction of where it does transmit and not transmits, as you can see that line, slightly angled. But that's the interface between whether it does transmit or not transmits. But long pass filters transmit longer wavelengths. And this is a long pass filter. And long pass, it's a long pass filter and its 50% transmission is around 820 nanometers, which is the same as the Rattan 87C. So, what, what is this transmission telling us about the range that we're recording? I'll talk about that in a little moment because what we're going to do is actually overlay all these transmission curves, all these spectral curves, and look at the exact window that we're actually recording. Now, this is one of the uh, filters of another modified camera that I that I had done some years ago, and I measured that uh, that. Um, filter and it's equivalent to the Rattan 87C, very similar to the previous one I just showed you. So I, ho I hope you, you can see that. It's really important that you see that the range these filters are transmitting are from 820 onwards and they don't, and they don't transmit any visible light. That's the key point to understanding the spectral transmission of these filters because we want to place these filters either over our sensor or over our camera, so we're just recording in the infrared range. Now, the fourth optical parameter, which one that often gets missed with a lot of the literature, but I think it's an important one, and that is the response of the specimen. And we, we talked uh, earlier on when we saw the results of some landscape photographs taken with infrared photography that there was a difference between response of different areas of the of the specimen. The trunk remained dark and the foliage appeared light. The difference between reflection and absorption. But there are actually four responses that's possible with a specimen. So in any sort of light range, but let's just use infrared, for example, because we're talking about infrared here. So if infrared radiates a specimen, it will it could either absorb the infrared and become darker it could reflect the infrared and therefore appear lighter. Or it could also, and these are the two uh, slightly odd ones, it could also transmit and become transparent. And I'll show you an example of this um, so you'll get it. Or it can luminesce or become fluorescent. So it could excite the molecules and actually become fluorescent. And that's called infrared luminescence. So let's, uh, let's have a look at some of the responses that, that can happen with any type of photography, including infrared. So this is your stock standard sort of landscape photographs that we were talking about before. So in this tree is a beautiful example of that absorption and reflection difference. So the trunk and the branches are absorbing the infrared while the foliage is reflecting it through that large amounts of chlorophyll that's actually in the, in the, uh, in the plant specimen itself. We can see the, the ground is reflecting a lot. The sky is absorbing the infrared. That sort of uh, grass in the left-hand side under the tree is pretty much of a mid-tone. And most greens and blues in the sky and the grass is very similar in tonality. It's about a mid-tone when you do normal black and white conversions. Now, this is an example of transmission. Now, this is a a text that I um, obliterated with a black marker over the top. So the top is the top image is just the same specimen shot two different times. So the top specimen is the same text, but I obliterated the writing with a black texture. And the bottom image is uh, shot in infrared. Now what's happened is that the infrared is actually transmitted through that black ink to record the text underneath. 
So that's an example of transmission, not one that we're going to use in creative photography, but I just wanted to illustrate that as a as one of the one of the responses that you can have from the specimen. And this is the fourth response, which is um, luminescence or fluorescence. Now, I have to say, I have to own up and be truthful about this. This is not infrared luminescence. So it's not a fluorescence that's been created with infrared light. It's been created with a green light, actually. Uh, but on the left hand side, we can see a bloody shoe mark on a black ceramic tile. Blood is dark, uh, so we've got a dark specimen against a dark background. We get no contrast. And on the left hand, sorry, the right hand side, so the left hand side's the, the specimen without any treatment, it's a white light photograph. And the right hand side, uh, I've treated that blood stain with a chemical called Hungarian red. And I've illuminated it with a green light around about 530 nanometers, a monochromatic light. But what, what is happening now is that that specimen is fluorescing and we get luminescence. So that's the fourth response that we can get. So the four responses is absorption, reflection, transmission, or uh, luminescence or fluorescence. But that's not infrared, so it, I am cheating there a little bit. Okay, so let's um, just let's just cap on those four optical parameters that we just saw and saw some responses to. So the camera sensitivity, we got to if we're shooting infrared, we're going to make sure the camera can actually record in that range. We've got to make sure that the light source actually does contain infrared. We need to make sure that our filter actually transmits infrared and doesn't absorb infrared, otherwise we're not recording anything. And this, the response of the specimen will actually change the effect that we get. Okay, so what I'm doing here now is I've overlaid those first three parameters. There's four lines there. The, the, the pink one, the pink dotted line is our human vision, which we saw before. So our human vision is very sensitive in the green, but it's only sensitive into that between that 400 and, eight, and 700 nanometers. But the other three parameters are very important. So when we combine these optical parameters, we can actually start to see what we're actually recording. So the orange light, the sorry, the orange line is the tungsten halogen light source. And we saw previously that not very sensitive, but doesn't have a lot of ultraviolet or blue content in that light source but has a very high amount of red and infrared content in the light source. The green line is the CCD spectral sensitivity. So the sensitivity of the digital sensor on the on the camera. And the blue line is the filter that's replaced the infrared blocking filter. So we've modified the camera and we've taken off the infrared blocking filter and now um, installed an infrared transmission filter rather than a blocking filter. So th those three parameters, the are all ticking the all ticking the boxes. The light source contains infrared, the camera can record infrared, and the filter is transmitting infrared. So what we get is a window of recording. A wind, uh, uh, within the spectrum, we're getting that sort of window within the spectrum. And in this case, it's around about uh, 820 nanometers up to 1100 nanometers. So that's the infrared range that we're actually able to record with those optical parameters in place. The type of light source we're using, the type of camera sensor we're using, and the type of transmission filter that's over the sensor. So that, that's really um, the only one that I haven't have left out in this in this chart is then the response of the specimen. But that's 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 uh, not kind of recorded here because there's so much variety of responses that you can get as we can as we've seen in some of the images. So that's the type of thinking I want you to understand, though, to be successful in infrared, you've got to have those first three parameters or matching up so that you get that window of recording within the infrared region. Okay, so here's a couple more examples of infrared so that you can put that, that, that those concepts into 
into some uh, make some sense of it. This is again more forensic application. So on the left hand side we have a pair of track pants, dark blue navy track pants with some blood stain on them and that's photographed under normal white light, under normal photography using electronic flash. On the right hand side we've got an infrared reflected image. Now what's happened there is that the the garment, the dark, visually we see that garment as being dark, uh, quite dark, quite that very dark navy blue, but under infrared it's actually reflecting a lot of infrared light, but the blood's absorbing the infrared. So now we have the contrast between the blood stain and the actual tracky pants, uh, the color of the tracky pants uh, through infrared. So infrared in a forensic and a scientific way is all about trying to uh, adjust the contrast of the specimen and the evidence, or the evidence and the and the and the and the, uh, and the, um, the specimen that it's actually located on. So now we can actually see the blood stain much more clearly because of the difference between reflection and absorption of infrared. This is one of my honor students' uh, research into imaging tattoos that have been lasered off, and we can see with the infrared the image that some of the pigments of the tattoo, even though it had uh, it was laser surgery about 25 years um, before this image was taken, you can see that there's still some residue ink in that tattoo that's being um, recorded in the infrared image. Again, the difference between the, well, this what this is actually showing is a bit of transmission. So the infrared being longer wavelength, uh, even longer than red, is penetrating actually into the skin and absorbing into the pigment. So we're getting that difference between the pigment and the skin. Okay, so let's look at now um, how to modify a camera. So as we discussed before, all digital cameras are highly sensitive to infrared. But the manufacturers, because of problems with lens design and chromatic aberration with, with lenses and so forth, and the fact that we don't want to record infrared most of the time, place an infrared blocking filter over the sensor. So the first step of modifying a digital camera to shoot infrared is the, the removal of that blocking filter. Now, there are companies that can do this for you. I don't recommend you do it yourself. Um, there are... They, it costs around about between about three and five hundred dollars to modify a camera. So there's uh, the first the first step is to remove the blocking filter. Your uh, high level of sens sensitivity of the of the digital sensor is not sensitive to infrared because of the blocking filter. So that needs to be removed. Now there are two options after that. So you the camera the, the sensor is is normally uh, naturally sensitive to infrared but it's also naturally sensitive to vis light uh, as well so you would mostly most of the times you would attach then a infrared transmission filter over the sensor to make the camera an infrared camera and that's what we've done at jcu so we have a infrared transmission filter over the sensor now blocking filter has gone infrared infrared transmission filter has been it's been replaced with the infrared transmission filter and they're all equivalent to Raton 87C but there's another option you can actually leave the transmission filter off and have no filter over the sensor and then use transmission filters on the lens so that's the second option so rather than place the filter over the sensor you can remove the blocking filter and, and not have a, a sensor, a filter on the sensor, but use a filter over the lens. The advantage of the second option, it's not one that I recommend, but it's it, it allows you to use different filters, different transmission transmission filters for different effects. And you'll notice when you look up camera modification, some of the, the tech uh, companies that do this for you, you will have quite a few different options, usually three, four, maybe five different infrared filters that you can actually replace the blocking filter with. So if you really want to play around and if you even want to get, shoot into the ultraviolet region, which is a lot trickier than infrared because of the lack of sensitivity, 
some some sensors are just not sensitive in that region and also glass absorbs ultraviolet too which is a, that's another problem but if you want to do a bit of experimentation you could in your modification have no no filter over the sensor but place the filters on the lens that gives you greater control but you've got to go out and buy a whole range of expensive filters as well all right so i just want to sort of give you this diagram of these options to, to make it a bit easier for you to understand. So this is my very crude uh, schematic of a camera. Of our lens out the front, our camera body, we have our sensor and the infrared blocking filter is installed on the sensor with all, all cameras. So the first step is to remove the infrared blocking filter and then replace it with an infrared transmission filter. So, as I say, there's usually about um, quite a few different options of filters that you can use. Some are not purely infrared. They actually um, go a little bit into the visual spectrum as well, but it just depends what you want. If you go onto the web, their web, these websites, uh, LifePixel is one, Camera Clinic in Melbourne is another, and they will give you all these options that you can do. But we, we've, we've kept it fairly simple and kept it fairly traditional, I guess, in in infrared by just getting an you know, equivalent 87C filter. And the option two is that we have no uh, filter on the on the sensor, but we place then an optical filter on the lens and you just screw that onto the front of the lens element. So the differences, the pros and cons, if you like, of option one and two, option one being putting a infrared uh, filter on the sensor. It's permanent and easy, easiest to use. You can frame and focus using the optical viewfinder. So when you're looking through the camera, you can focus and there's, there's no problems because the light um, is transmitting through the, through, at the sensor level, not at, not at the glass or the, the lens area. The disadvantage is that you're stuck with only one single transmission filter. So option two, um, where you screw the, um, you don't have any transmission, uh, any infrared filter on the sensor and you place a filter on the lens. It provides you a great more variety of options for that one single camera. Because once you get a camera modified for infrared, you can't convert it back to normal photography. It becomes an infrared camera only. The other problem with option two is that you can't use the optical filter because infrared transmission filters are optic. Well, well, um, they're, they're not see-through. They're because they're only transmitting infrared, which we can't see. So visually, they're they're transparent. They're opaque, visually opaque, but actually they do transmit infrared. So if you screwed that in on the front of your lens, you look through the camera, you can't see anything. So you can't focus, you can't see the image. Now the option here though, is that you can use live view. So if your camera is able to use live view, you can turn on live view and frame and focus the camera through the live view uh, system, which is a bit, bit more difficult. So there are your two options and your sort of pros and cons. My preferred option is option one. It's a lot easier and that's what we've done at JCU. Okay, so I, I, I sense that you're all excited about infrared photography and you want to go out and try it, which is fantastic, and I hope you do. Uh, certainly, that's why we've modified a few cameras so that you, that you will able to give you that option. But there's a couple more things that we've got to tell you about before you go out, rush out and actually start shooting in this, in this type of photography. The first one is the infrared focus shift. Now, infrared is generally a longer wavelength, which in a technical sense means, or optical sense means that the, when you focus it, it focuses it at a, a, a different distance to your normal visual field. When we're focusing the camera, we're focusing in the visual range, but the camera is recording in the infrared range. And that focus point is different, or it may be different. It is different. So we have to then adjust our focus to shift it to infrared even though we can't see it so how do we do that well there's a couple of couple of methods that you need to be familiar with 
most camera lenses have this little red dot. Can you see that little red dot on the depth of field scale? That red dot is the infrared focus shift. So you would focus normally uh, in white light, obviously, because that's all we can see, vis a vis light, that's all we can see. And then you shift that distance scale across to the infrared marker. Hey, pretty simple, eh? Just move it from uh, uh, the normal focus under white light and just shift it over until that red dot and the job's done. Pretty good for uh, most applications, I guess, but in the close-up range, it doesn't work very well. So just test your lenses out for this and you will find um, uh, ways around manipulating this. But you can see that it's a slight shift to the right. So a few options that you might want to consider to deal with this concept of focus shift. First of all, you can use the red red dot. It, 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 it increases the focal length of the lens. I think it's 1%, if my memory serves me correct, 1% increase of focal length. You can use live view to focus, although I find that very difficult to focus through live view. But if you're certainly doing close-up work, that might be a better option than the red dot. You cannot use autofocus systems because they don't pick up the infrared and they're not they're not effective. So you can't use autofocus systems, unfortunately. The other option is to use a greater depth of field. And as you would have learnt in digital photography, if you increase the depth of field, you're actually increasing also the depth of focus. And the depth of focus is that area in the on the film plane. So cr shooting with smaller f-stop numbers increases the depth of field but it also increases the depth of focus which will help with infrared uh, with, with the focus shift i find though um, if you're shooting landscape work which is shot mostly at infinity the distance of infinity you're not going to get much of a problem with the infrared shift anyway so if you're shooting landscape work you can pretty much get away with it without any shift um, just think about your depth of field and your depth of field scales maybe uh, if you're using hyperfocal distances, you've got to be a little bit careful with that. But um, at infinity distance, it's not it's too much of a problem because the depth of field and depth of focus is probably already taking care of that anyway. As I say, when you're shooting up closer, if you're shooting portraits or um, leaves, close up leaves and bugs and things like that, you probably find the focus shift is going to be more predominant. You can do a range of tests if you're going to shoot at a particular distance. If you're doing a lot of macro work at the same distance, you can test for the focus shift and then adjust that focus shift by moving the camera um, back. So that's, there's lots of uh, uh, approaches to, to deal with this. Um, I'm just going to make you aware of it. And if your images are coming out fuzzy, and but you're spending a lot of time focusing and you know it's sharp, but they're still coming out fuzzy, it's probably due to the focus shift. So you need, need to rethink your operations. The second issue with infrared is exposure. Now, our TTL and handheld light meters don't measure infrared. <laughs> they, they, they're not infrared meters, they're light meters, not infrared radiation meters. So the, but this is easy with digital cameras. All you have to do is make sure that you use the histogram. Just shoot it, use the histogram, make your adjustments uh, of exposure through the histogram and, and, and it's fine. That's, that's really easy. But don't rely on your automatic systems without looking at the histograms. Shoot it, look at your histograms and evaluate it. And you might have to adjust your auto compensation up and down to compensate for the lack of the light meter's ability to ac accurately measure the infrared. Points that you need to consider when you're shooting the focus shift and exposure, use the histograms. Okay, so shooting with our, our cameras, the JCU, the infrared, the infrared filters have been removed and replaced with a transmission filter. So you don't need a transmission filter on the lens. There's already an infrared filter on the sensor itself. The filter is equivalent to a Rattan 87C, which is 820 nanometers at 50% transmission. You can shoot normally using the histogram to judge exposure and just be conscious of that concept of focus shift. So 
just be aware, use maybe smaller f-stops if you can get can to get better depth of field and depth of focus. Okay, so you've gone, got all excited, you've borrowed one of our infrared cameras, you've gone out and shot all these beautiful landscapes and you come back and ugh, this is what you see. It's red or magenta cast. Don't panic, this is normal. This is what the infrared images look like raw from a, a digital uh, a digital camera this this cast is natural it's a it's a natural cast because it's a color system and we're using an infrared filter which is only kind of recording the red areas of the spectrum so even though they're past the red spectrum but this is the result you get this magenta cast and what you have to do in the post-production is convert this image to this image so you need to take away that sort of cast so you get this nice clean tone and and this is one of Anne's uh, photographs and she's done some beautiful split toning on this as well which is just recently shown me which is absolutely spectacular where you get split toning is where it's a black and white image but the highlights are warm and the shadows are cold that's why they call it split toning so warm highlights cold shadows and that really adds to the to the to the snow effect this is shot in japan all right so how do we how do we convert our um, black and white images into um, uh, or our infrared images into clean infrared black and white images the recommended uh, method that i would recommend there's several ways of doing it but i recommend that through acr that you use the hsl grayscale conversion which you can see in that little diagram there I've, I've used. Uh, so you just click on that button, uh, convert to grayscale, and you do have some color sliders that you can change. Now I found some images you does change the tonality uh, a little bit, others it doesn't, but it just depends on, on, on what's been recorded. Another way you can do it is set the saturation at minus 100%. So you can, I think I've got an image there, of that here it is here oh no sorry that's a uh, of the ARC uh, ACR should be uh, Adobe Camera Raw not A ARC should be ACR Raw Processing um, you click on that uh, conversion and then some of the sliders will actually automatically just go to these these uh, these settings but you can adjust that a little bit more the one I don't recommend is just go to saturation and just go to minus 100% saturation. Um, that's uh, that's that, that works. It'll turn it into a grayscale, but it's not not the best option in my view. You can convert these in Photoshop as well. I recommend you convert them through um, ACR. Uh, you shoot them raw. You should shoot them raw and then convert them at the time. The best reason the most um, obvious reason why you should be doing it at the at the raw stage is because you're dealing with 16-bit image so you've got maximum amount of information to make those that make those uh, conversions as well but you can do it in you can should still do it 16-bit with photoshop uh in a tiff file or something like that but it's uh you can do it through this black and white uh filter you can go through the image mode uh, or you can do it as an adjustment layer. You can apply this black and white filter in adjustment layers as well, which is probably the better way of doing it if you don't do it in ACR. You can also uh, do such satur use saturation in Photoshop. Might just slide this the uh, saturation to minus 100%. I don't recommend that as well. But there's another option in Photoshop. You have different types of modes of images and you can go image mode and convert it to grayscale but that's almost like a jpeg effect in the sense that it, it automatically has an algorithm just to just to uh, convert it over you don't have the control like you do with this black and white filter or certainly with acr um, the black and white um, conversion there too which is which is very similar to, to this system so that's the hue saturation just um, a dialog box with Photoshop just sliding that saturation over to minus 100%. Not recommended, but it works.
Okay, so that concludes the lecture on infrared, and I hope that you're excited about this type of technique. It is, it offers a great opportunity to extend outside norm, what we call normal type of standard photography. Uh, as I say, we have uh, several cameras that you can borrow and experiment in this range. We hope, we'd love to see some images in your folio, but that's up to you. It's not, not compulsory that you go in, down this field. But certainly, uh, we'd love you to, uh, encourage, certainly can encourage you to go out and experiment and try this type of, type of technique. You have to remember and understand the optical parameters, but we've pretty much done that work for you. We've already have a infrared transmission filter over the sensors, so it's just a matter of going out in a light source like direct sunlight, which contains infrared radiation, and just going out and shooting with it. So it's uh, all the technical stuff's kind of already considered in the modification. It's just go out and have a bit of fun with it. So thanks very much for listening, and I shall talk to you soon. Bye-bye.